While taking a course on mathematical proofs at my previous college, I was encouraged to find and try to make conjectures on mathematical and real-world concepts found outside the classroom. As someone who loves to look for visual patterns in the real world, I started researching different things online and came across a mathematical picture known as the Ulam spiral. The Ulam spiral is the arrangement of the positive integers in a square spiral, and the example that I saw put the first positive integer 1 at the center of the spiral and then grew in a counterclockwise fashion from there. The Ulam spiral in particular depicts the spatial relations of all the prime numbers in this grid or lattice, and what has been shown to happen is the prime numbers form distinct horizontal, vertical, and diagonal lines when the grid is extended to the first couple hundred or thousand integers, and it of course continues forever. Multiple conjectures and formulas have been associated with interpreting the placing of these lines of prime numbers, so I knew that this spiral already had the potential to carry patterns yet unseen. I came back to the Ulam spiral multiple times and at one point became interested in the apparent fact that the spiral can be centered on any positive integer and the lines of primes will still appear. This example shows the spiral being started at 41 instead of 1. Something about how the Ulam spiral started at 1 didn't sit well with me, so I redrew the spiral on a sheet of grid paper, but this time I started the spiral at 0 because I thought it would be appropriate to start the center of an infinite spiral with zero, because it just felt more complete. Drawing the spiral, while repetitive after a while, didn't fail to keep me occupied, and I treated it as a mathematical doodle of sorts, which was incidentally how Stanislaw Ulam, the person who first made conjectures on the spiral, allegedly created it as well, as he was doodling it in the middle of a boring lecture. After recreating the spiral, which I've done here in Microsoft Excel in a process that's much quicker and larger, I didn't pay much attention to the prime numbers because I wanted to see if there was something else that I could do that didn't involve primes, and I hadn't really seen other examples of something besides prime numbers involving the Ulam spiral anywhere on the internet. The first thing I noticed was that the squares of the integers fell along two diagonal lines. The even square numbers extended immediately to the top left of the zero box, and the odd square numbers extended to the bottom right of the zero box but offset by one square. The placement for the square numbers makes sense as each square number appears after the same number of boxes has been drawn, including the zero box. And of course, since we're working in a square lattice, you can always take the square root of the square numbers and recognize that all the boxes drawn beforehand fit in a perfect square, with sides as long as the square root of the square number. From here, I thought it would be a good idea to focus on the even square numbers, as that line extended directly from the zero box. I enjoyed the idea that all of these numbers just happened to appear at an increasing distance of one box away from the center. So now I was thinking of the Ulam spiral more radially instead of just a spiral. I realized that I could group all of the boxes in the Ulam spiral into larger concentric, what I will call fences, which sort of destroys the visual representation of a spiral, but it's okay, it's still there. If this picture hurts your eyes a little bit, I can sympathize as I've spent a lot of hours staring at it myself. So now I was thinking of the Ulam spiral as a set of fences, containing boxes within. I called the fence containing just the zero box the zero fence, the fence containing the zero fence as well as boxes one through eight the one fence, and the fence after that the two fence, and then the three fence, and then the four fence, and so on. So naturally, each even square number falls into one larger fence. I paired up each square number with the fence that it fell into, and then divided the square number by the fence that it appeared in. So in this case, zero divided by zero doesn't give us much, of course, but four divided by one gives us four, 16 divided by two is eight, 36 divided by three is 12, and so on. When written out in ascending order, I noticed all the results differed by four. I then tried this out with the line of odd squares on the opposite side and was disappointed that the resulting quotients didn't have the same consistency of differences of four. I wondered if it had anything to do with the fact that this line of diagonals was offset from the zero box, so I tried repeating the process on the line of numbers that truly extended to the correct bottom right from the zero box, and the process worked again. Wondering if this would work for the other two diagonals extending from zero, I repeated the process on them and again got ascending quotients that differed by four. Wondering if I could push my luck further, I did the same with the horizontal and vertical lines of boxes that extended from the zero box as well. And it worked. It was at this point that I realized the correlations that the spiral had with a two-dimensional coordinate plane. We have a horizontal and vertical axis of sorts, with an origin at the zero box. If I were to draw lines through all of these numbers I had worked with so far, ignoring the list of odd square numbers in red here, I would have lines with slopes of either positive or negative 1, 0, or an undefined slope. These correspond to the equations y equals positive or negative x, y equals 0, and x equals 0. I wondered what would happen if instead of having a line of slope 1, which is moving one box up for every box moved to the right from zero, I used a line of slope two, or y equals two x, or two boxes up for every box moved to the right from zero. So I tried it out. Now notice this time that we only get half the amount of boxes, and they exist only inside even fences. However, 
The pattern still worked, except this time the quotients increased by 8 instead of 4. I wondered if there was a way to use the odd fences as well and somehow close the gap back to 4. So here I had 13 divided by 2 and 58 divided by 4, which equals 6.5 and 14.5. In order for the gap to close back to 4, I would need the quotient 10.5 in the middle. And since we haven't used fence 3, a little reverse division, or as I like to call it, multiplication, means we're looking for a box labeled 31.5. Now, of course, there is no box labeled 31.5. However, if you were to look at the line y equals 2x, which we're using, that goes through all of these boxes, you'll notice that it goes precisely through the point between box 31 and 32, right inside fence number 3. And now we've struck gold. And as you might expect, you can find these magic numbers for the other trouble spots on the quotient list as well, and now the difference between quotients has been brought back down to 4. And to top it all off, this works for the line of boxes on the other side of the zero box as well, completing the line y equals 2x, as well as the lines of boxes that correspond to the lines y equals negative 2x, y equals 1 half x, and y equals negative 1 half x. So I thought to myself, well, that's all fine and dandy, but this whole time we've been working with simple 1s and 2s for our slopes. What about an odd slope like 3? I tried it, and like the lines of slope 2 had half as many full boxes as the lines of slope 1, 0, and undefined, the lines of slope 3 had a third as many complete boxes, with a gap of 12 in between quotients. But the missing quotients are still there, except now instead of falling right in the middle of two boxes, they fell either a third of the way or two thirds of the way from one box to another. And of course, this works for the line of boxes with slopes of 3 negative 3, 1 third, and negative 1 third. I didn't test out beyond this, but I'm assuming you can do the same for slopes of any integer n that are positive or negative n, or positive or negative 1 over n, possibly even slopes that are not simply of the form n over 1 or 1 over n. This was an important turning point in my exploration of the Ulam spiral because it made me realize that we didn't have to treat it as a spiral of integers, but as a spiral of assumingly infinite points between integers as well, using the integers as benchmarks and turning points along the spiral. With this new thinking, I decided to redesign the grid so that I wasn't dealing with a spiral of boxes, but a spiral of points that had integer values along the way. From here, I don't really have anything that I did that resulted in concrete conclusions, but I did experiment a bit. The first thing that I did was to draw lines in between each integer dot and its square dot. So that means connecting 2 to 4, 3 to 9, 4 to 16, etc. Since all the squares of all numbers fall on the same two diagonal lines, I sort of expected the resulting shape. However, it didn't hold too much interest to me, possibly because the lines expanded out way too fast, farther and larger than I could draw all the dots. So I reversed my thinking, and instead of connecting numbers to their squares, I decided to connect them to their square roots, which turned out to be a much more painstaking but fruitful process. Since most square roots for the numbers aren't integers, I resorted to drawing them to points in between the integer dots. Here are the results all the way up to integer 289. As you can see, a few shapes have formed in the middle. As this process continues and the number of integers in between any two given squares increases, the shapes become more and more defined, but harder to draw with a pencil and paper. It would be really nice to be able to have a program that can do this. While doing this, I noticed that some of the lines that I drew were perfectly horizontal or vertical from a certain integer to its square roots. I collected these integers and found the proportions between any two consecutive ones and graph the proportions. The resulting curve resembles a function of the basic form y equals a plus b over x, but funnily enough, the proportions do not constantly decrease, they instead continue to fluctuate up and down. I don't know if there's anything deeper to be pulled from this, especially since connecting integers to their square roots is pretty arbitrary, but I thought it would be useful to develop a sort of program that can draw similar graphs on a larger scale to save time and pencil lead. However, I don't actually have the skills to do that. If anyone can find a way to make a digital Ulam point spiral and find ways to connect lines between integers and their squares, their square roots, cube roots, or even just multiples of integers and find the resulting shapes with hundreds or thousands of points in the spiral, or if you decide to use the Ulam spiral in other interesting ways, please let me know in the comments below. I wish I had the means and the programming skills to make such programs, but I'm sure someone out there has the means to make this a fun little project to build. I hope this video was useful to you and hopefully you can take the concepts explored here and discover something new with them. Thanks for watching.